This presentation, I will be discussing some of the terminology that's used in the telephone business. The video I'm making is more geared to the beginners uh, that are starting out collecting telephones as a hobby and wanting to uh, move forward. As with any industry, there's a large amount of abbreviations used um, by the experienced people, as well as in printed material. So before I get too involved in that, there are two telephone collector clubs in the United States. One of them is the Antique Telephone Collectors Association, and they primarily deal with telephones from the 1880s up to the early 1940s, maybe slightly into the 1950s. There's an additional club called the Telephone Collectors International. They primarily deal with the telephones from the 20s up to divestiture, which happened in uh, 1983. January 1st, 1984 was the end of the Bell system. Actually, December 31st was the end. January 1st was the beginning uh, of the seven regional telephone companies that were created from the Bell system. There were many hundred independent telephone companies out there, and they were not directly impacted by the breakup of the Bell system, as in having to make rural changes and so forth, such as the Bell system did. The independents were very much impacted, but the impact was uh, shortly after divestiture. So I will uh, talk a little bit about that. So if you have an interest in some information, both of those telephone clubs are very good resources. One of the things about the telephone industry, regardless of which facet you are interested in, uh, there's a tremendous amount of technical information uh, that the clubs have. There are several telephone museums within the United States. The two largest ones that I have been to and uh, have a slight involvement in uh, is the uh, Connections Museum in Seattle, Washington, and the Ellsworth Main Collection. Uh, they have both of them have working switching systems as well as some telephone displays. There's also another museum in California, the JKL or American Telephony Museum. And then there are many smaller pioneer type museums throughout the United States. The Telephone Collectors International Group has three or four different uh, sub-chapters, so to speak. So if you're interested in just telephones, that's what the club is primarily uh, focused on from a broad scale. However, there are groups of people who are into the business telephone systems, the central office switching systems, and a lot of the advertisement and attachment memorabilia as well as documentation collectors. There's not very much information on the internet uh, from a video point of view that I have found to help people who are coming into this with absolutely no knowledge at all. And I will try to show a few items to uh, help illustrate why the terminology was used uh, in this video and then I'll be talking more than anything.
One of the most common talked about part of the terminology regarding telephone lines is the tip and the ring. You will find that this will be a very common theme within the telephone industry. Any of the information I'm providing today is uh, applicable up to around 2000. This does not include any of the IP type technology. This is all primarily analog technology that I will be discussing. When you find documents or talk to people regarding different aspects of the telephone business, single line phones, multi-line phones, phone lines, and so forth, there will be many references to what is referred to as a tip, a ring, and in some cases, a sleeve. The tip and ring or sleeve goes back to the 1880s and 90s when manual switchboards were installed. They were, of course, very crude at that point. However, they did um, still switch calls with them. And the term tip, ring, and sleeve came from the cord that the operator used that would connect between two telephones. Here in 2020, some people would refer to it as a patch cord. And in essence, that's what it was. However, in the switchboard, there were possible coils or capacitors depending on what was happening, as well as switches so that the operator could interrupt the call, listen in on the call, and so forth. I am holding up a three-conductor plug, and the very tip here is what they call the tip. The middle one here is the ring, and the long neck is the sleeve. If you look at very early switchboards, they only had typically tip and sleeve because it was a two-wire system. This cord was, of course, used in a later switchboard or other applications. You will not find these cords um, used at the customer premise, uh, such as homes, apartments, and so forth. You would find them where there may have been a manual switchboard of some type or a operator switchboard for long distance calls or uh, exchange calls. So this goes back way, way, way into, again, 1880s. Here in 2022, for the analog portion of the telephone network, what little bit of it remains, they're still referring to it as tip and ring. So this will be found in many documents, new and old, very widespread against different manufacturers. For those who are collecting telephones, again, depending on the vintage of phone and the manufacturer, when you get into the telephones that were made into the uh, late 1880s and 1890s, after the patent rights had expired on the uh, Alexander Graham Bell patent, there were many different companies that were making telephones and improvements to telephones. Then when you get into the early 1900s, there was still a large percentage uh, or large group of manufacturers making telephones. And then when the Bell system was formed, or maybe I should say when AT&T decided to create a unified company and then the Bell system was born, and that is a very complex uh, uh, discussion that I don't want to get into in this video.
AT&T owned Bell Telephone Laboratories and Western Electric Company. At one time, Western Electric made lots of different things. They made washing machines, irons, sewing machines, telephones, intercom equipment, telegraph equipment, TVs, well, not so much TVs, but um, theatrical projection systems. And then there was a antitrust lawsuit that put an end to that. So then AT&T focused on telephones only. When AT&T, through that decree, uh, created, or let me rephrase, when the Bell System was uh, envisioned and, and somewhat founded, the Bell System used exclusively AT&T slash Western Electric products. However, AT&T did not own majority interest in all of the Bell operating companies. There were a few Bell operating companies that they owned a minority interest in, and those companies could utilize equipment made by Automatic Electric, ITT, Kellogg, as well as several other manufacturers early on. In the collecting world, there are people who will only deal with Western Electric phones, or automatic electric. The independent telephone companies, such as your co-ops, mom and pops, and smaller regional telephone companies, for the most part, just used anything they could buy because telephones were scarce. The demand far outpaced the manufacturing capability. And then we had the war, which uh, created its own issues. And then uh, the rest of it just, you know, after the war, then the production was ramped up and so forth. If you're collecting a certain vintage of phones, um, as I stated earlier, there is a lot of information out there. And the early telephones did have a little bit of variations in terminology. For an example, automatic electric used plus and minus, as where plus was the tip and the minus was the ring. If you look at the DC telephone system, the power plant, it is positive ground and negative source. So if you're dealing with certain items, you may find that the plus terminal will end up effectively being an earth ground somehow, somewhere, for some reason. And again, that is a very complex issue, but you may find a document that kind of references that indirectly. The telephone switchboards of the early days were two wire switchboards because there was relatively little signaling other than you had a magneto that you cranked that sent a high voltage of 60, 70, 80 volts down the line to ring a ringer or drop a, a flag on a relay coil at the switchboard. Then if the operator needed to call a subscriber on the line, they would utilize a magneto that would ring the phone the same way as you called the operator. In your larger cities and exchanges, the early ringing machines that was invented for the operator so they did not have to manual, manually crank a crank like the subscriber did, they had a motor connected to a belt that was uh, simulating cranking the ringing, the uh, magneto, which is all it was, is a motor driving a magneto to give continuous ringing, and then they just had a switch similar to a light switch, except it was able to transfer from one source to another to ring the phone. If you're dealing with magneto phones, <clears throat> you'll see that the magnetos had different configurations for party lines, because in the early days, there was really no such thing as a private line. There was just virtually no telephone traffic 
the facilities were just astronomical. Uh, so the phone companies would put multiple people on the lines. And when you look at the telephone switchboards, every single business that had a, a, their own listing, if they did have a private line, was a dedicated two wires from their business back to a switchboard. And if you start putting up miles of wire, the cost just goes through the roof. And because of that, they made multi-party lines. So if you're working on telephones um, prior to the dial stuff in the 20s, party lines was everywhere and many different manufacturers made many different types of configurations to deal with the party lines. They used frequency selective ringing, superimposed ringing, code ringing, um, and then they had grounded ringing and a lot of different variations. So depending on the telephone set you're working with, um, you may find documentation that'll make reference to different types of ringing schemes and uh, wiring schemes. So that is one thing to keep in mind. If you're involved with telephones of the 20s, on up to the 80s, such as the D-mounts, which um, Western Electric made, uh, the candlestick phones, and there's a multitude of those by Kellogg, uh, Western Automatic Electric, and others. Way too many more than I can remember or mention. Those phones all required what was called a subset and depending on the telephone exchange that that subset or that phone was used in would determine the subset. The early ones were made out of wood and they would have a magneto, possibly, or they would have batteries. Well, every phone had a battery. Magneto phones as well as uh, uh, select common battery phones that was what was called local battery and they were used in some very rare cases, but they did exist. So when you're dealing with those kind of phones, um, the terminology mostly went from the magneto to the non-dial and dial sets. The early telephone sets for the most part were all manual telephone sets. There was no uh, dialing from the phone, so an operator completed every single call. Automatic Electric, through uh, acquiring the patent from Almond B. Stroger, began to have a dial system, and they called it Stroger Automatic Telephones. Those telephones do still exist, but they are into the many, many thousand dollar range for the most part. And this, the early dials such as the Stroger dials are incompatible with anything today, unless you build a circuit to convert it from what they call a three wire system to a two wire with uh, automatic type control stuff. After that system, the bell system began creating the panel switch and uh, a different type of a rotary dial. And then the rest of the industry quickly standardized on the rotary dial that we kind of know of today. And there was v massive variations of those dials depending on the manufacturer. There are two different types of early telephones when you get into the manual or dial sets. They had side tone circuits and anti-side tone circuits. A side tone circuit, the transmitter, receiver, and a battery was in series with itself and there would be um, an induction coil, kind of like a half-ass transformer. And that had an issue that uh, was kind of self-regulating, and I wished it was in the cell phones of today. 
if you had a side tone phone and if you had a person who had a high volume output that was very loud spoken, when they used the telephone, they normally toned it down because they were getting almost 100% of their speech in their ear. So it helped self-regulate the volume. The anti-side tone, which is what we're familiar with from basically the 30s on, um, only gave you a small amount of your own audio back into the receiver. So a person who had a high voice would still talk very loudly and you would have different levels at the other end. The very early phones, primarily the Magneto phones and early common battery and dial sets and the switching network, the long distance network, you had to have telephone transmitters that were high output transmitters. They had no amplifiers in the early days. So the length of the phone call was determined by how far a person's voice would travel over the wire. And they got, you know, probably 30 to 40, 50 miles without too much difficulty, but the longer it went and so forth, the more louder the person on each end of the phone had to talk for the other party to hear them. And there was lots of different transmission things tried the size of wire and so on and so on, which there's an enormous amount of information in the Bell system, uh, technical journals about the engineering and how that all worked. I mention this because depending on the telephone and the subset slash bell box, uh, you may find uh, side tone and anti-side tone circuits in the subsets and the way that the telephones wire. One of the problems with collecting the telephones from the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, they all required a subset bell box. And you may find at antique stores and secondhand stores a candlestick phone or a D mount, a sh short D mount, an automatic electric um, squatty phone, ashtray phone, and so forth. They had a subset bell box within four or five feet of the phone that was the other half of the phone. Well, those were thrown away abandoned or because they had ringers in them at times they would just leave the subset with the ringer so you'd have a loud ringing bell and the telephone was gone. So you'll find that you only have effectively half of the telephone. There are many circuits in both clubs I believe that show how to incorporate the more modern network uh, and or hot wire the phone, such as a series wired phone like the early days with an induction coil uh, to make them work. One of the problems with doing that is you don't want current to flow in the receiver element and doing a hot wire circuit, you have current flow, which will eventually reduce the sensitivity of the receiver unit because you're um, creating a DC flow through the magnetic field and it will just eventually decay and break down. There are also subsets that come up on eBay and at phone shows and so forth, but they're usually a high dollar item. So for every uh, phone that you find, uh, there's probably a hundred more telephones all missing their bell box subsets. So if uh, you only have half the phone, there is hope. Uh, and this is where you need to get into uh, the clubs because you'll have people with more experience at uh, helping uh, with schematics and components. I'm primarily dealing with telephones from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's 
what my main focus is. However, I do have a fair collection of telephones that are uh, early wood wall phones, magneto phones, early non-dial common battery, anti-side tone, and so forth. As the technology progressed, um, the terminology also progressed. So in the telephone world, the transmitter, which people like to refer to it as a microphone, that is not the correct terminology. It is what the telephone industry called a transmitter. A microphone was used for radio broadcast and that type of stuff. Radios were still 20 to 30 years away from the initial invention of the telephone. The, so your documentation is going to refer to it as a transmitter. The earpiece that people like to refer to it as is a receiver. Of course, in the days of uh, radios, broadcast radios and so forth, you would also have a receiver in your house. It had vacuum tubes in it and it was uh, able to receive radio signals. So there is a little bit of um, overlap or misunderstanding. So your documentation and the people who are really into this will never refer to any telephone parts as a microphone or a speaker. They will be referred to as a transmitter and receiver, even up to the point after the breakup of the Bell system. When the electronic telephone systems begin to appear in the market after divestiture, if they had dynamic microphones, which now we are talking about a microphone, the industry changed again from um, transmitter to microphone. So depending on the vintage, you may see some references like that. But anything prior to 1984, um, it'll be transmitter receiver. When you get into the ringing, of telephones, there was a multitude of different ringing scenarios. Far too many for me to discuss in this video. I've created videos regarding ringing of different types, as well as there is information out there. One of the biggest issues with the phones prior to the 1920s is many of them had frequency selective ringers, which are practically useless in 2020. And then depending on the telephone company and the manufacturer of the telephone in the 20s, 30s, and 40s and 50s, there were different ringing schemes such as frequency selective ringing, and there were two different types, decamonic and decimonic. And for an example, you'd have frequencies of 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60, and then you'd have um, 33 and a third, 44 uh, hertz, and up to 66, and I believe a third hertz or 66. So if you find a telephone that has a ringer in it, Depending on the age of it, the odds are it's a frequency selective ringer and unless it was a 20 cycle or a 30 cycle, they're never going to ring. There are also two different types of 20 cycle ringers. Maybe type is not the proper term, but there are the 20 cycles that are specifically tuned to only ring on 20 cycles and then your C4 type ringer, such as a standard residential rotary dial uh, telephone at the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, that'll pretty much ring on anything you send to it because they're not uh, frequency specific. And those ringers are pretty common. I know from watching different chats that the ringing is hard to describe. Um, 
it's there's a lot of information but there's so much information for a beginner they'll get become very confused very quickly and you can tell by looking at the ringer if it is a frequency selective ringer or the markings on the ringer uh, there's also ringers that were intended to be on long rural lines and then ones that were used in town they'd have bio springs on it um, and again there was a lot of science that went into that because uh, if you had a ringer uh, 10 miles away from the central office with a whole lot of other phones in the same line they used different ringers because of the amount of power it would take to ring all those phones and remember if you're cranking a magneto depending on the type of a party line you might be ringing eight or ten other ringers at the same time as trying to call the operator and that can become a uh, quite a challenge none of the phones in the early days were plugged ended such as uh, early uh, cords, some, somewhat similar to the one I showed earlier that had a switchboard plug on it. They were a different style, but the same concept. They were much shorter in length and so forth. That was very rare, but it was used in certain applications. So the phones would be hardwired. In the days prior to really the 1980s, if the telephones were on multi-party lines, then you would have between the telephone and the telephone company lightning protector, generally a three conductor wire, tip ring and ground. The ringers may be connected from the tip to the ringer to ground or the ring side of the line through the ringer to ground. This reduced the amount of ringers on a line. In other words, ringers were not bridged across the line. They were what was called grounded ringing. So you may find phones that the ringer went to a G terminal and the other side of the ringer to an L1 or an L2. So that is another situation that can be a confusing issue for people. The ringing on telephones in the 1800s up to the 1920s, so to speak, was not consistent. Now, if it was coming from an operator, it would be fairly consistent. If it was coming from a subscriber, it would be everywhere. 60, 70, 80, 90 volts. Depending on if it was a magneto phone, if it was a three bar, four bar, or five bar magneto. When you got into the dial phones, that's when the ringing started to become consistent. Generally, a straight line ringer will ring on 80 volts up to 105, 110. If it's a fairly modern phone of the 70s and 80s and if it was a frequency selective system and you had a 60 hertz ringer you might see on a voltmeter 150 to 160 volts of ac uh, current so you don't want to be playing with the phone and having someone call you because uh, you'll get shocked and i can tell you from experience it's not fun so that is one thing to keep in mind one other thing is when you're looking at documentation depending on the vintage of the phone and the manufacturer in the early days they did not have what was called capacitors they referred to them as uh, condensers they were uh, just huge rectangular type uh, boxes when i say huge two to three inches long half inch thick three quarters of an inch thick, maybe an inch and a half, two inches wide, and they'd have anywhere from one, two or three wires coming out of it, depending on if there was one or two um, condensers, AKA capacitors inside of the uh, can.
as the telephones modernized and they went to the more of the 500 series of the 50s on, they changed the terminology from condenser to capacitor. And you will have one, two, or three capacitors in a phone. One of them will be in the ringing circuit. One will be in the dial circuit if it's a has a network. Um, those are the two, plus there will be some baristas and other things that can be in the network. When the early phones came out, they had <clears throat> what was called inductors, and there was a handful of different types of inductors. When, in the 50s, when the more modern phones were de uh, developed, they put in a cube inside of the phone that's approximately two inches wide, three inches long, a couple inches tall, and they called that a network. The most common one is a 425. What made it a network instead of a induction coil is it has an induction coil inside the network. It also has capacitors and varistors in there. So they changed the terminology to say this is a network. So it still functions the same as having uh, condensers and induction coils. But they're, instead of individual components, you're now into a more modular packaged arrangement. The condensers in the telephones can and do go bad because it's a capacitor is basically a film, a paper, a metal, and kind of an oil. Um, depends on what they were trying to do at the time. And like anything else with age, they dry out and they can go bad. It's not that common that they go bad, but they can go bad. The networks, basically the 50s on, out of the thousands of phones that I have worked on, I've only had one or two networks that I had to ever change out and they were the very late modeled ones that were poorly designed that did not like to be dropped. And that was the Western Electric 4228 type of a network. It was a cheap network, cheap design, and they could fail. There's tens of thousands of phones with a minute. They did kind of come up with a solution for it later on, but that's what I have seen fail. When you get into the ringing, um, a ringer is a coil of wire or two coils, depending on the type of a ringer. And they need to have a, cond a uh, condenser or a capacitor in series with it. Otherwise, you're shorting out the phone line with a high resistance short and you'll be off hook towards the operator all of the time or the line would test busy if it was on a dial exchange. So it's important that they're in there. When playing with telephones, regardless of the type of phone, the one caution is if you're dealing with a magneto telephone and you have a magneto generator and you want to convert the magneto phone to be used on a more modern type of a phone line or here in 2022, like an ATA such as Vonage and so forth, you do not want to crank the magneto and send ringing generator in to the device that could damage your ATA device. If you have a real traditional telephone line and you send ringing generator to the central office, the switching system will mark that line as having trouble and will put it out of service. And depending on the type of switching system, it may have to be manually restored back into service by somebody. I can tell you that from experience because that's what I did. So you want to be careful of that. The thing about magneto phones is you can take two magneto phones and put them on two wires connected to each other and make phone calls between them. 
Um, the batteries that's used inside of the telephone is simply in series from the transmitter to the hertz switch to the battery and back. So when you pick up the receiver, you're um, putting, well, and the induction coil, you're putting those in series with one another so that when you speak into the transmitter, it has power because it's a carbon, well, I'll use the term, it's a carbon microphone, uh, which is easy to describe it, but again, they still call it a transmitter. And of course, you would need the same thing at both ends. And then the wires between the phones, they only carry a dry audio or the ringing of the magneto when you crank the magneto. So you can make an intercom out of two magneto phones very easily, and it's fun to do. If you have common battery telephones and you try to connect two of them on the same line, if it's a telephone line from a telephone office or a switchboard or something like that, you can talk between the two telephones just fine. You cannot signal between them because there's no method for doing that because um, they're intended to be connected to a switching system. But like two phones in the house is on a, so to speak, a kind of a party line, and that's how party lines worked anyway. You could pick up the phone in the kitchen, one in the bedroom, and you could talk over it. And that's a common battery circuit. However, if you take a 12 volt car battery or a lantern battery and you hook two telephones in parallel on the same two wires on one battery, you cannot talk over that circuit. You do not have any um, impedance. Uh, or a relay coil or anything so that it will f make the phones function correctly. So it's like hooking two light bulbs or, or two drop treble lights on one extension cord. Yeah, both will light up fine, uh, but in, from an audio point of view, you cannot talk between the two. If you put a relay coil in series between the power supply, such as a battery, and the line going to both phones on one side of the line, you can talk between the phones. If you don't have the relay coil, a light bulb, or a resistor, you cannot talk between the two telephones. And people think they can take two phones and hook them up to each other and make them work uh, using a battery, and that is not the case. They will not work. It will require a little bit um, uh, effort put into it. And again, there's many different circuits out there that describe how that's done. I will end this video in a couple of minutes. One of the things about telephones manufactured by different companies of different vintages, the likelihood of being able to interchange parts on phones before the 1940s, maybe even the 30s, was pretty rare. Uh, the telephones of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, for the most part, if they were ITT, Stromberg, Western Electric, Northern Electric, you could interchange components without any trouble in most phones. If you're dealing with magneto telephones, uh, a lot of the components could be mixed between different manufacturers because magneto phone is a very, very simple um, phone and there's really nothing specific, manufacturer specific. Uh, but if you're gonna put together a Kellogg phone, you should keep it all Kellogg parts. Refurbishers of the early days, they just made phones out of any part they had available. So it's pretty rare you're gonna find a early phone that's original <clears throat> manufacturer of parts. When you get into the phones of the teens and 20s again depending on the manufacturer there was quite a few of them <clears throat> some of the parts were interchangeable um, and i won't get into the details because now you're getting to the you know phone specific stuff and there was refurbishers that were assembling phones out of anything they could get their hands on 
but there were certain manufacturers parts that would work well with other manufacturers and some parts that mechanically would not work. If you have anything made by automatic electric uh, of the phones that are the plastic colored phones, you have to have that specific manufacturer of phone. Nine o'clock p.m. Temperature 65 degrees. Sorry about that. You have to have that manufacturer of parts for that phone. They were not interchangeable with other manufacturers. So there are people who like automatic electric stuff that have huge collections of automatic electric equipment. And there's some fantastic colors and styles of automatic electric phones. I'm personally not an automatic electric fan. I do have a few of them, but uh, I primarily stay with the Western, ITT, Stromberg, and so forth. And if you're a serious phone collector, you should try to have a variety of phones manufactured by uh, other companies. There's also an enormous amount of telephones made overseas that have been imported to the United States. And there is way more than I could ever even begin to try to talk about. Uh, different vintages, different countries, different manufacturers and so forth. I'm pretty confident in saying that any phone that's imported to the United States, you're not going to find really many parts available. And most of the phones that were made in other countries, you need to have the components made by that manufacturer. Again, there's a couple variations to it, but for the most part, um, if you have a Siemens and Husky phone, you really kind of need a Siemens and Husky part. And there are international collectors, part of the TCI club, and I'm assuming the ACTA club, that do supply parts for the people here in the U.S., as well as there's people here in the U.S. that gladly send um, U.S. parts overseas for the collectors who have uh, North American type telephones. I do intend on producing some additional videos uh, explaining things that none of them are going to be specific to any one telephone. I do have a lot of different videos talking about specific phones or a series of phones. Presently, I'm sitting in my business telephone display room. And I have another room that's all dedicated to single line telephones. And I will probably make the next video from that room. As you can tell, there's many phones in here, many different colors. The majority of what's in this room is manufactured by Western Electric. There's also an enormous amount of pay phones. And I will briefly touch on different pay phones uh, that's made. Uh, those are far more complex because of the design of them. Electrically, a payphone, for the most part, is no different than, shall we say, a 302 uh, desk phone from the 30s and so forth. I hope to come up with a quick display of some of the D-mount phones, the 302s, um, 5302 and some of those that are more common out there. Uh, I do have a bunch of those. They're in another room and I need to get my act together so I can take a video of those to help uh, show what they look like. Uh, the one thing I recommend to people if you're beginning to collect phones, um, if you have mechanical skills, the phones are not difficult at all to work on. It's understanding the terminology and the schematics. And I did create a video a long time ago in non-HD that 
I briefly showed a schematic for, I believe it was a 500 set or a 2500 set. And I do have lots of documents, so I may make a video that kind of shows some of the uh, Magneto phones as well as the early common battery side tone, anti side tone, and so forth. Uh, I find making a video for that kind of stuff is cumbersome and probably not too helpful other than pointing out a few things that may be um, bonus information that someone may not pick up on right away. Again, both of the clubs have lots of people and they have phone shows throughout the U.S. and there's a lot of great people that you can reach out to that are more than happy to help. There's some YouTube videos produced by people that show how they're doing things. Uh, there's a lot of videos out there that kind of, you have to already kind of know what you're doing because they don't really explain it in detail. That may be the best and I'm not a teacher, so I cannot explain the super detail of the stuff either. And I do not make any effort at trying because I would just be a train wreck doing that. If you liked anything that I've said, please uh, subscribe if you would like. Give me a thumbs up. Um, share the video. I do have a Patreon account, so if there's someone wants to uh, contribute to my Patreon account, uh, it's in the link below. Uh, I do have a lot of switching videos, business telephone system videos. That is primarily my interest, but with having 1,800 lines of my own switching system, I also want to have lots of telephones to hook up to the switching system. I try to make everything I have work and I do have a couple items that I do not have the needed equipment to make them work. they will just be a static display. I do intend on in the future creating a video showing some modern, semi-modern in 2020, they're antique, but uh, phone systems of the early 90s that are very simple and ideal for collectors if they want to hook up a handful of phones and be able to dial between the phones or dial an access code to reach a landline or a cell phone adapter, an ATA, and so forth. And I will discuss that in the future. I think I'll have two, possibly three parts to discuss other issues. And you can leave comments below on maybe some specific things that you're looking at. I do not intend on making phone specific videos because there's thousands of phones and it would take far more years than I have left alive to do. And again, I'm not a teacher, so I'm happy to provide some general information and assist in that way. And any comments are welcome on things that you may want to see or clarification. Thank you.